Alright, welcome back to Belay Masterclass. Previously in this series I covered every single piece of gear that you will encounter in sport climbing, some ninja ways to tie knots, and top rope belaying. And now we are ready for lead belaying. But before I start, I have to say that just because you watch a YouTube video doesn't mean that now you know. I know Kung Fu. Show me. So use this video only as supplemental information to whatever practical training you're doing, hopefully with somebody experienced. And this video is not about how to use your belaying device. I covered that very deeply in this video. So if you are somebody new to climbing, I highly recommend to watch these two videos first. Also, I have to mention that there is still debates in the climbing community of what is the correct way of using the belaying device. And different countries have different recommendations. One subject for disagreement is so-called tunneling method, where you're sliding your brig hand like this when you're taking slack. covered this topic in this video, but my personal take is that this sliding is not an issue if you're using assisted belay devices. And then there is another disagreement on the proper use of Grigri. Official Petzl recommendation is when you're giving slack you can do this, but then if you need to give more slack fast you can press on Grigri scam while you have the rope with three fingers on the rope and continue giving slack like this. However, after that, you should bring your brake hand away from the grigri. However, if you observe experienced climbers, you will notice that most of them will not bring the brake hand down and will simply keep the hand on the grigri all the time. And there is benefits to that. First, you can give more slack this way. While your left hand is pulling up, the right hand can pull down and now you just added extra slack. Second, by having your brake hand here, you can take the most amount of slack. Because if your hand is somewhere midway, now you are very limited of how much slack you can take. You will need to bring the hand back if you want to take a lot of slack. So this position naturally gives you the most control in any situation and allows you to micromanage the slack. The drawback of this is that in some rare cases, if you don't have a good grip on the hand, the grigri might slip. So you have to be aware of this, especially if you're using super skinny ropes. But despite of that risk, you will see me keeping my hand on the grigri most of the time, because this is my preference, and you choose the method which works for you. And I go to belay. All right, so we want to lead this route, and me, as a belayer, I will be spending a lot of time looking up. And since I'm looking up, I don't have enough time to look down what's under my feet. So it's a good idea to prepare the space so I will not trip over something. So if there are some things, you might consider moving them. I don't know what this thing is doing here. Next, I look into the root and see where it goes. In this case, I see a lot of chalk on the left side, so that's where the climber is gonna climb, and so I want to avoid standing in his fall zone. So I will be standing a little bit more to the right, so I place my rope back even more to the right, but in front of me. In this case, if there is any tangles with the rope, I can see them and deal with them easily. If I would place my rope back behind me, it's more complicated to see issues with the rope. Okay, then you get a climber, and before I take him on belay, I like to look into the first bolt and estimate how much rope he will need to clip it. So in this case, it's more or less like that. I always go a little bit on the bigger side, because safer is always safer. 
And before he goes on the route, we obviously need to do a body check, but as I already mentioned in the top rope video, I don't even like to call it a body check, because if I would just check my body and my body would just check me, there is chances of failure. In particular, we are not even sure if we are on correct ends of the rope. So instead of that, this is what you do. First, I check my harness to make sure that my buckles are secure. Then the carabiner, it needs to be locked. Then the delaying device needs to be inserted in the correct orientation. And then I start tracing my rope. You might see people even collecting the rope like that. And this is to ensure that we are on the correct end of the rope, not on something wrong. And finally, I check his knot and his harness. Now, obviously, while the belayer is checking the climber, the climber should be checking the belayer. And there is one slightly annoying thing, at least for me, what some climbers do, is when the climber takes on the rope and pulls on it to test if the belay device is working. But who likes to be pulled around? So instead of that, the belayer should do this pull test and the climber should observe. Also, if you are a long hair owner, it's a good idea to take care of that because if it gets into belay device, it's really difficult to self-rescue. That's another reason for using a helmet as a belayer because it can keep your hair on the backside. And the same goes for the climber. Yo, bro, who got and finally, I highly recommend to wear shoes as a belayer. Last year in Seyuse, we saw a girl with sandals that don't protect the front of the toes kicking something really hard during the catch of the fall and bleeding all over the place and then the hike down is like one hour of hike and that's a pretty sad way to end your climbing trip. And another good way to ruin your climbing trip is by not having the knot at the end of the rope. Oh, that was fast. Yeah. Statistically, this is what causes the most accidents in climbing. So double check if you have a knot before you start climbing. And now we are officially ready to climb. Yay! Okay, climb in. Climb on. Always fist bump as well. <laughs> Always fist bump. <laughs> now, if the beginning of the route is challenging, consider spotting your climber. And as the climber is approaching the first clip, you can adjust the rope estimation so that as soon as he clips, he's already safe to climb and not waiting for you to... Just a moment. Just a moment. Just a moment. Here is another example. As the climber is reaching the clip, I notice that there will be too much slack, so I take some of it out. And as soon as he clips, he's instantly safe to climb. Now, while the climber is low on the route, the belayer must avoid standing directly under the climber. But also, if possible, do not stand directly behind the climber, because that often positions the rope between the legs of the climber and uh, risks uh, damaging private parts. The best position usually is slightly on the side of the climber. And since a lot of you are terrified of falls that are low to the ground, I'm gonna make a dedicated video on how to belay these situations. So yeah, subscribe. And here is another bad example. If the climber would fall at this moment, his butt cheeks would probably hug the rope. So to avoid that, it would be better if the belayer would be standing somewhere in this area. And another thing you should do while the climber is low on the route is to help to manage the rope. Here I kept the rope close to the wall so it's easier for the climber to step around it. And here is me climbing, where I will need to step around this rope, so my belayer actively moves the rope out of my way. It makes so much easier to get around the rope and into the flow. All right, next let's talk about slack management. And so that we are on the same page of vocabulary, slack is extra rope between me and my climber. So. In this case, there is no tension on the rope, but there is no slack. And here I have one hand of slack. This is how one hand of slack looks. Slack can also happen at the climber's end of the rope, especially after he just clipped and now he's moving up, or between the quick draws. This happens more often in extremely overhanging routes. So, do you want to tell uh, what happened here? Where should we start? 
this climber here is uh, digging a hole to, uh, <laughs> with the shovel. There's a move where they cut loose and to not short rope your climber, uh, there, is a, there is a risk that, the, that they will hit the ground. <laughs> so, yeah. so they're digging a hole. <laughs> digging a hole. <laughs> okay, how much slack should you have when you're belaying? The answer is enough to not limit any of the climber's movements or clipping, but anything more than that is unnecessary. Now you might see other coaches recommending that the rope which leaves the grigri shouldn't dip below the belaying device, meaning that it shouldn't do this, instead it should leave and go up. However, take this advice with caution, because how this loop looks depends on how you hold your belaying device. It looks like this when I hold it here, but if it's, it's like that, it looks completely different. And also, it depends on how close you're standing to the wall. Because if I stand close to the wall and I try to avoid this loop, then I will end up with something like that, which is very little slack and it's very highly likely that you will short rope your climber. Now, before I give you my recommendations, I have to say that how you manage your slack while the climber is climbing up can be completely different from the situation where the climber is falling or about to fall. Because if the climber is falling, you have many options. You can take the slack if you think that that's necessary. You can do nothing or you can proceed with a soft catch. And I will talk about these cases in the next video. And in this one, I will focus on what you do while the climber is simply climbing up. So with disclaimers out of the way, you can manage the slack by obviously feeding the rope through the belaying device and by stepping forward. So if I step forward, I introduce slack. If I step backwards, I reduce the amount of slack. Also, you can combine these two. So you can feed the slack through belaying device while stepping forward to give more slack. And then you can take and step backwards to take the slack quicker. In general, lead belaying can be broken down into three phases. First is when the climber is below the quick drop. In this case, you should belay the same as if the climber would be on the top rope. There is no need for any slack. Now, when the climber is transitioning from under the bolt to above the bolt, you will need to start giving slack and maintain a good amount of it. Here, my climber moved closer to the bolt so I take out a little bit of the slack. And as my climber starts climbing up, I continue giving slack. So it's a very dynamic process. So the way I like to think about a good amount of slack is in terms of arms of slack that I paid out. So as my climber is transitioning from under the bolt to above the bolt, I will want to give about half of arm of slack. And this is gonna create this nice belly. And this is probably good amount of slack for majority of situations in climbing. If I would take that out, this is more or less the amount of slack I had. The good amount of slack also depends on the speed the climber is climbing. If it's slow, you can be more conservative. However, if the climber is climbing really fast and if it's very important send attempt, then you might want to have more slack according to the situation. And in case the climber is climbing really fast and clipping really dynamic, you might consider to give about full arm of slack, which would look something like that. And a good part about having not more than one arm of slack is that you can always take it in one motion. And this is the amount of slack I had. It's a little bit less than a meter of slack. So, this amount of slack is probably the absolute maximum you will ever need on any climbing situation. And if you would have more than that, you might risk unnecessarily big fall. And then in case you need to take, it's going to take you multiple actions to complete the taking, which is also unnecessary. On a contrast, having too little slack is one of the most common beginner mistakes that often end up as a short rope for the climber. Of course, if the climber is low to the ground and about to fall, having no slack might be the best option. 
Otherwise, here is an example why in majority of situations I recommend about half of arm of slack. My climber decided to do some ninja clipping from the position where no one else clips, so I was not expecting that. Luckily, I had about half of arm of slack and that was just enough to not short rope him. Now, normally you can anticipate when the climber is about to clip and you will have more time to give enough slack for that. However, beginner belayers still get in trouble when the climber needs a lot of rope for clipping fast. And the best strategy to deal with that is to drop the full arm of slack and prepare to give more. And then give more as needed. And once the climber clips, you can take out the excess. With this strategy, you're giving at least two and a half arms of slack to the climber. And in 99% of the cases, this should be enough. Alternatively, if the clipping is really fast, you can also add a step forward, which also adds extra slack. Now, obviously nobody likes to be short roped during the clipping, but same goes for micro short roping. When the rope is blocked just for the moment, these moments cost energy for the climber and must be avoided. If you're belaying and short rope happens, the best strategy is to immediately step forward while at the same time unlocking the belaying device. The stepping forward helps to unlock the device. So to recap, while the climber is under the bolt, you will be mainly taking the slack out. And once the climber transitions above the bolt, then you will need to give slack and maintain a good amount. Usually between half to full arm of slack works the best. And anything more than that is very, very rarely beneficial and simply asking for trouble. Clipping. And independently of how great of the belayer you are, at some point you will probably get into a situation like this. So first of all, you can greatly reduce the chance of that happening if you manage your rope well. So when I carry my rope, I always, always make sure to tie both ends of my rope to the rope bag. This prevents the chance of the knot forming in a way that I would not be able to untie it. The only knot that you can get is maybe something like that. But if that happens, you can always untie it. Although you cannot get a knot in the rope, you can still have a tangle. And to minimize the tangles, it's a good idea to stack your rope nicely before you climb. Come on. Nice. Okay, great. Come on. Come on. And the good part that after the climb, you don't have to stack all the rope. You just need to restack the part which you used for the climb. So all of that is good. And now I'm just gonna restack what I already used. And one more thing that you should not do is take rope like this and just throw it in. You will definitely cause tangles. Instead of that, you want to put the rope on the side and restack this little bit nicely. That will save you from lots of troubles. And if you're done with the climb, tie your end of the rope to the rope back. Now, if your rope is still causing you problems, you can find a moment when the climber is safe and prepare some of the rope. Of course, make sure to hold the brake side of the rope while doing so. Okay, pulling. Okay, the next problem with beginner belayers is that they don't know how to efficiently take the rope. <laughs> okay. Hard. Going up and down, up and down. Okay, if you want to be nice to your climber and help him to go up easier, you want to come under the first quick draw, but keep sitting in the harness so that all my weight is holding him or pulling him up. Now a little trick how to take efficiently so that I help my climber the most. So I put a little piece of tape here and if I take efficiently, this piece of tape should not move up. Because if it moves up, that means that my climber went down and he will need to put extra effort in moving up again. So how can I take that 
this piece of tape doesn't go up. Well, I want to grab my rope really hard and do one arm pull up to lock this marker while taking the slack through my belaying device. However, I cannot do one arm pull up. However, I have legs that can help me. I can grab as hard as I can, pull right hand up while pulling left hand down and use my legs to help me. So this is how it looks. See, the marker stayed. Or if you want a greater effect, you can even hop up like so. I literally jump with my legs while taking the slack and keep hanging while my climber is pulling. So that helps him the most. Once I reach the ground again, I can take again. And if there is an object in front of you that you can step on and do a little step or hop up, it's even better. So if I would jump from this, I can take a lot of slack. It's very easy for me and it's very good for my climber. Wee, wee. Wee. So this technique provides the most assistance to the climber, however, if the climber is significantly heavier than the belayer, it might be hard to execute. In that case, I would recommend to time the moment when the climber is pulling on the rope with the moment when you're trying to take out the slack or the moment you're trying to jump up. Alternatively, you can use the technique of walking backwards. It's easier for the belayer, but the further you go, the less you help your climber. In fact, you know what? Let's test how much more efficient it is to take under the quick draw compared to going backwards. So I rigged this system where my rope goes to a dynamometer so we can measure the force. I'm gonna see how heavy Ben is. Let's see how heavy Ben is. If I'm hanging directly under... Ben's heavy. 0.62 kilonewtons. Now let's see what happens if I start going backwards. So if I'm here, it's at 0 0.39. Yeah, let's see how much I can do here. Oh wow. It's 30. Let's go far. Okay, let's try here. Come on Ben, you can do better than that. How much? 21. 21, he says. Ugh, but I'm like pulling really hard. If I'm just like casual, this is a casual, like kind of pulling casually. How much is it? 18. 18. Actually, when you are taking, if I jump up, then momentarily I deliver a huge force down. That peaked at 1.23 kilonewtons. If I would time my jump together with the climber, he would get Propelled up. Yeah. Let's see what's the peak if I'm just pull hard here. Okay, go. <coughs> no point seventy. Let's see what's my peak if I try to do it here. Zero point six two. Zero point six two. So conclusion. If you want to be nice for your climber, be more under the quick draw when you're pulling your climber up. If you have your feet on the ground. Or Let's see. It wasn't much. The enough. question was from the audience. <laughs> Does it change if I have my feet on the ground? Now it's 63, 64. Now I have gently touching the ground. It dropped to 60. Now if I'm kind of like standing, it's 50. If I'm kind of like standing, I'm kind of hanging kind of standing, it's 45. Mm. So only like Purely hanging, it goes to full force. But this is still quite effective, while this becomes already way less effective. Yeah, you, you get tired less while belaying, and your climber gets stronger. So this was an introduction to belaying, which is still missing the most important part, what to do when the climber is falling. Man, I cannot give you a soft catch this way. To answer that, I measured hundreds of falls and made a mega study on soft catches and all of that is coming in the next video. And for now, huge thank you for Mammut and for my Patreons for supporting all of this video series. And if you are benefiting from it a lot and you want some karma points, I've heard some rumors that there are karma points in that website. 
Hope you enjoyed this one. Enjoy climbing and see you in the next one.